I've rewatched movies by Ho Sao Sien many times for two reasons. First, there's an addictively beautiful quality to them, mesmerizing like a sunset. Secondly, after all these viewings, I still struggle to explain the plots. Those are Ho Sao Sien's trademarks. He makes me, as a viewer, feel cocky about enjoying such lush art films, and also feel completely out of my depth to explain what appear to be fairly simple stories. <laughs> Born in Guangdong in mainland China, Ho moved to Taiwan as a small child. His movies are not all set there. He's done several movies about mainland China and even did a film set in Paris starring Juliette Binoche. But it's fair to say he focuses intensely on Taiwan. He was one of the first Taiwanese directors to deal with the worst moments in his country's history. He filmed A City of Sadness in 1989 when it was still taboo to discuss the February 28th incident and the following decades of martial law. The incident? A dispute over smuggled cigarettes escalated into massive protests and then horrific violence. Somewhere between 10 to 28,000 people were slaughtered by government forces. That's pretty heavy stuff to have hanging over your national identity, especially when, like Ho, you have an obvious affection for your country. Not an uncritical one, but certainly a warm affection that revels in the simple details of life. Ho made what people call his history trilogy, the last of which is Good Men, Good Women, a fictionalized version of a true story of filmmakers making a fictional version of the true story of a woman who fought against the Japanese in the early 40s. This was not the first or last time Ho would swirl documentary together with dramatization. The film's real-life protagonist met with filmmakers, but sadly she passed away before she could see her life story on screen. In Good Men, Good Women, a group of Taiwanese friends struggle through many obstacles to, to join the anti-Japanese resistance in mainland China, only to be imprisoned by the Chinese resistance when they get there. Because they come from Taiwan, the group is nearly executed as Japanese spies. After time in a labor camp, they're released and they fight with the resistance, guerrilla style, against the Japanese for years. Then they return to Taiwan, where they are again arrested as pro-Maoist subversives. Several are even killed by the government. The Nationalist Party, the Guomindang, looks pretty bad on both sides of the water. The movie is in no way pro-Mao. Ho Sao Sien is dealing with his own country's sins, not those of the PRC. There's a lot more to the Taiwan new cinema than just Ho Sao Sien. He's simply the most internationally successful of many 1980s Taiwanese directors. If you want to learn more about that crop of amazing talent, seek out the documentary Flowers of Taipei. While Ho's films sometimes demand rewatches to understand their stories, the stories themselves are actually pretty simple. Relationships crumble, and the hero is stupefied about what went wrong. The cinematography is tightly controlled, the acting is improvisational and loose, as is the storytelling. If you're expecting a melodrama or action film, you've come to the wrong place. Ho can make a film about brothels with no sex or nudity, a film about martial arts with almost no kung fu whatsoever, a film about guerrilla warfare and prison violence where no violence is shown. It's the people and their emotions that matter to the director. A perfect example. In A City of Sadness, the deaf Wen Ching is accosted on a train by KMT policemen. He can't understand them, and when he speaks, his odd accent makes the police assume he must be Japanese. Well, his best friend tries to intervene and explain. Cut to the friend struggling to get home on a fractured leg, and his family reacting in sympathy, fear, and anger. We know what happened. Ho doesn't need to show the violence any more than he needs to show us what happens when Wing Chung finds out that his dream girl's in love with him and their awkward marriage. We get it. Can a movie succeed entirely by looking and sounding beautiful? Ho Xiao Xian makes an argument for that. Millennium Mambo and Flowers of Shanghai, for example, offer very little story but amazing visuals and sound. Flowers of Shanghai boasts some of the most intricate costumes I've ever seen, bringing pre-revolution era brothels to life vividly. Millennium Mambo does the same thing for 2000s Taipei, but through music and garish lighting choices. Taking place in nightclubs and squalid apartments, animated by a murky, throbbing Sign of the Times electronica soundtrack, Millennium Mambo drags you into its bleakly sexy world. When the heroine changes her lifestyle abruptly and the story shifts to a quiet, snowy Japan, it's just as beautiful and the emotional contrast is portrayed through sights and sounds. Ho Sao Xian had a flair for visuals even before he began collaborating with master cinematographer Mark Lee Ping Bing, who did both of the films just mentioned and many more. A scene as simple as these three men waiting for the birth of a child is composed with vertical red elements dividing the screen and the men's color matched costumes dividing the screen horizontally. Certain rooms are shot always with the same composition through the whole film, using doorways and windows as a frame within the frame. Ho chooses a look and goes for it with gusto. In Flowers of Shanghai, the incredible layering of patterned brocades and wallpapers and furniture leaves us with the characters' faces illuminated like floating heads. As humans, we cling to what looks like us on screen, just faces and hands in this case, to anchor us. The effect is as disorienting as a night smoking opium with your mistress. 
Bertolt Brecht believed that you need to use distance to keep the audience uninvolved so that they can make rational decisions about what's happening in the story. Ho Xiaoxian uses distance in the exact opposite way. Quite literally, Ho often avoids close-ups to set the viewer not at a dispassionate distance, but to place them directly into the room as an additional character. He does this with a couple of unusual choices. One, he takes extremely long takes. Flowers of Shanghai, for example, lasts about two hours and consists of just 38 shots. That's about as many shots as your average two-minute fight scene in Hollywood. He averages three minutes, ten seconds per shot in this. Flowers of Shanghai is one of those just-dare-me-to-film-this movies, like Slacker or Russian Ark. There are few close-ups, and often the camera is positioned as if you're at the dinner table or in a chair in the same room as the characters. It feels like you're a character, whether a Shanghai businessman or one of the flowers themselves. While Flowers of Shanghai is an extreme example of daring stylistic choices, the same sense of intimacy through distance is in many of Ho's films. The camera moves little or not at all, forcing you to experience life's chaos as it happens as a passive viewer. There's an amazingly disconcerting scene in A City of Sadness, where a a couple of gangsters try to take revenge on other gangsters with machetes. Shot far up the road, as if you were a child just coming across this scene, with the violence often obscured by bushes or buildings, it's the polar opposite from similar scenes in Scarface or The Godfather. American movies push the terror, the pumping pulse, the blood right in your face. Ho Sao Sien makes the violence just as horrifying, but does it from a safe distance, the distance from which most of us see such atrocities. We can't empathize, but we can still sympathize and fear. Like most directors, Ho has had several preferred actors. His are a more eclectic lot than most. The soulful Tony Lung shows up in several of his films, maybe most memorably as Win Ching in A City of Sadness, and as a detached gentleman in Flowers of Shanghai. In City of Sadness, Lung's character plays Beethoven records because he recalls how much he loved them as a child before an injury robbed him of his hearing. In Flowers of Shanghai, he's unable to connect with anybody, including the women he is sleeping with. In both cases, Ho taps into Lung's strong point, his ability to act without speech. Ho also had a series of films with puppeteer Li Tian Lu, making fictional films and a quasi-documentary, The Puppet Master. Not the usual muse that one expects. Ho's interest in puppeteering spills over into that Julia Binoche film mentioned earlier, Flight of the Red Balloon. You might not enjoy Ho's free-flowing, anti-Spielberg style of storytelling, but nobody could fault him for lack of originality. More recently, Ho has made a series of films starring Shu Qi. Shu Qi has a mixed filmography. She's worked with Jackie Chan, Andy Lau, Stephen Chow, Jason Statham, and Wen Jiang. She got her start in softcore schlock like Sex and Zen 2. I first saw her in the CGI fest Storm Riders, where she portrayed an unattractive tomboy. Uh, good luck with that. Joining up with Ho Sao Xian took Shu Qi one step further away from being treated as just another pretty face. She shines in Millennium Mambo, even if you want to scream at her character for making so many bad choices. The heroine struggles to leave a bad relationship and ends up leaving Taipei for Japan, only to be ghosted by the guy who's supposed to save her from her train wreck of a life. After a few other interesting films, Ho casts Shu Qi as the wuxia heroine of The Assassin. It's a martial arts film containing almost no martial arts. Instead, the movie, like all of Ho's films, is about where loyalty must lie. Should you devote yourself to your family, your passions, or the friends who have supported you when all else was lost? <laughs> What's really extraordinary about Ho Sao Xian is that, emptied of conventional plots, he gives his viewers both content and form. The content deals with national betrayal, with personal identity, with, with bonds forged in passion, blood, or guangxi. The form pummels you with his striking visuals. Ho seems to have turned that old cliché, a picture's worth a thousand words, into a science. Partially, this is thanks to Ho's devotion to ellipses. Whereas mainstream films show the most important events to push the plot forward, Ho shows the aftermath of those events. He uses these gaps in action to focus the story on the humans on screen, rather than on the mechanical plot, as most films would. He doesn't manipulate us with the Spielberg zoom or shaky cam or obvious three-act structures. He sets the people before us, and if we have hearts, we will connect with them.